I want you to take your Bibles or take your message notes and turn to Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 6. And uh, we have seen God do some great things through this series. We've also seen the devil fight, and uh, we are uh, fine with that. We are in a series called Battle Ready. We know that the spiritual battles are inevitable. That's what we've been saying from the very beginning. Uh, But power is possible in the protection of Jesus Christ. The very first service was a little bit different. We had an alarm going off just next door in the unit that we don't, do not lease, and it was very loud. In fact, it was very hard to even concentrate, and uh, we did, did not know how it would turn off, and uh, we had no way of turning it off. And right when we opened God's Word, it turned off on its own, and uh, we're thankful for that. Uh, we believe that the preaching of the Word of God is powerful, not because of me or because of you or because of anything other than the power of the Word of God. It is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And we're going to talk about the whole armor of God. We're in the second piece of armor. And uh, so if you need some message notes, just raise your hand. If you need a pen, raise your hand. Uh, we're going we're gonna to read this passage again and uh, then pray. And we'll dive right into it. Today we're going to be talking about the battle vest. We're going to be talking about putting on the breastplate of righteousness. It's found in uh, Ephesians 6 and verse number 10. It says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the wiles of the devil. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness of this world, and spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. That's the belt of truth we talked about last week. And then it says, putting on that breastplate, of righteousness. Let's pray. God, we want to put on your righteousness, your righteousness, not our own. I pray that you'd please use this. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would calm our hearts. I pray that you would focus our attention on your truth, your word. In Jesus' name, amen. There are lots of different questions that we could ask to see if we are battle ready. But the number one question to ask to see if you are battle ready is the question, am I ready for conflict? We asked, are we ready for temptation? We've asked, are we ready for surrender? Are we ready uh, last week for confusion? And we want to put on the belt of truth because that's the only way to overcome confusion. But today I want to lean into the conflict because every conflict, there is a battle for victory. There's a battle to win. And in the spiritual battle, uh, the, the adversary is seeking to kill, to maim, and destroy. In fact, we have an adversary that is trying to rob from us the new life that we have in Jesus Christ. He's trying to steal kill and destroy the abundant life that's talked about in John 10.10. And he is the thief. He is trying to steal the truth of God's word from this very moment from your heart. And if you'll lean into it, I think you'll understand from this passage that it's trying to protect us, not in our own righteousness, but in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Now, there are two different kinds of righteousness. There's the righteousness that is self-earned. It's the righteousness that the Jewish leaders had in the time of Jesus, where they decided to try to obey the 613 laws of the Torah and the uh, 243 uh, oral laws that are still being added to even to this day in the Talmud. I will tell you that that righteousness lifted them up with pride to the point that they did not want to accept who Jesus was because it would mean rejecting who they were. And so they rejected Jesus because not that he didn't have power. They didn't reject him because he was not who he said he was or because they could find fault in him. They rejected him because of who he was telling them they were. He was telling them that they were unrighteous. And they couldn't accept the fact that their righteousness was not enough. They could not accept the fact that their self-righteousness had lifted uh, themselves up with pride. And I will tell you that every conflict that we have in our lives is really a result or a cause of self-righteousness. In fact, that's the key question is, is our righteousness a 
a cause for conflict? Is our self-righteousness lifting us up with pride, as Proverbs 13 says, that only by pride cometh contention, but with the well-advised is wisdom. I will tell you, every conflict within yourself and around you and in your relationships is a result of self-righteous pride in your life. I was sitting on an airplane a few months ago, and it was a longer flight, and, and uh, we had uh, our stewards and stewardess came out to, uh, to uh, bring out the snacks, and I was looking forward to those little, uh, the little pretzels and little snacks. I, uh, for whatever reason, that day hadn't eaten a lot, and I was like, man, this is uh, going to give me some nourishment to continue. I was getting some work done on the flight, and I sat down next to a very uh, uh, kind couple. They were uh, nice to talk to and, and uh, really enjoyed their conversation. In fact, uh, they were from Southern California, it just so happened, and so I was thankful to talk to them about them and their family, and I was telling them uh, a little bit about what I get to do and, and all of that, and and uh, it was just a great conversation. We sat down, and we started eating our snacks, and and as is the custom on a plane, you know, we're all smashed in there, but, um, and we have the masks on, you know, by the mandate, but then uh, we, you know, sit down to eat, so we I'll take the mask off, and I was eating my uh, my pretzels and drinking uh, my Coke, and uh, when I uh, was finished eating and drinking, I placed my mask back on, started working. We landed, and when we landed, the man sitting next to me decided to let me know how unpleased he was with the fact that I did not put my mask back on in between each bite. And every drink, you know, and I, you know, thinking back, he did that, but I didn't. They didn't make an announcement to do that. I didn't know to do that. In fact, if I would have been asked to do that, I probably would have. But he was so upset. Now, you have been in these situations like I have, and I have never been yelled at so loud and so hard by this who had been such a kind gentleman just a few moments. That entire time, from the time that that moment happened to the time that we ended, to the, we landed, he was just apparently had just been seething. <laughs> the, the boiling. And the boiling point came uh, when I was uh, getting off the plane and I just said, so nice. To, I had no idea he was upset. I said, so nice to meet you guys. You have a blessed day. That's literally all I said. I said, you have a blessed day. And I'm telling you, the stewards and stewardess were, were climbing over people before we got off because they thought he was going to attack me. In fact, I thought he was going to attack me. I have never been called so many names. There were names I didn't even know existed that I was being called that day, all because there was a way that he was doing things that he wanted me to do them, Right? And I was doing it differently than he was doing it. And he felt the way he was doing it was right. And the way I was doing it was wrong. He had his own version of what was right, what was healthy, what was good. The only thing is he didn't share that version with me. Until at the very last, it just kind of spilled over. And I will tell you that our righteousness... All of us can get to the point where we feel like the way we're doing things is right and the way that everyone else is doing things is wrong. And that is the cause for every conflict in our lives. And so I use that illustration to say this, that every issue is a hard issue. And every hard issue is an issue of our values. I think there's two questions that are asked inherently from this passage about the breastplate of righteousness, and it's about our heart. The, the breastplate protects the vital organs, and there's no vital organ more important than your heart. We'll talk about that. And then it's a breastplate of righteousness, and righteousness is God's right standard. It is His rightness. It is valuing what God says is right more than what we think is right. All of us can get a little bit upset with someone else when someone, what, what we think, you know, oversteps our boundary of what we think is right. Now, everyone is uh, entitled to what they think is right, but ultimately what God thinks is right is his righteous standard. That's where we get the word righteousness. Okay? So I want to walk you through those two questions based on the 
breastplate, protecting our heart, and righteousness, God's righteous standard, his values. Okay? And so let's ask the first question. Uh, How is your heart? How's your heart? Is it being protected against evil? Uh, Do you have something built in, some boundary? Now, some might ask, well, I I think my heart's good, my heart rate according to my watch. No, no, no. The the Bible often uses the heart, which is an organ that pumps life and blood into our body and gives life. Without the heart pumping, you do not have life. And so the deepest part of us, uh, in in fact, in in the psalmist says, uh, examine me, uh, try me. In fact, he says, he says, try my reins. That's your feelings. And he says, and my heart. And he's not talking about trying to see if his heart is pumping right. He's actually using the heart as a metaphor to say the, 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 the part of me that's the deepest part of me. In fact, psychologists have tried to break this down and say, yeah, when we're talking about the heart, we're not t- actually talking about the thing that pumps. We're actually talking about the deepest part of the mind. And Some, some have tried to say it's the, uh, the pineal gland or, 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 or that deepest part of your mind that, that is who you really are. I think the psalmist summed it up in Psalm 103 when he says, bless the Lord, O my soul. And that's something that we would use a soul, right? A um, little bit different than a heart, but he says, and all that is within me. That is certainly the case. Everything that's within you, the, the, the non-material part, not saying that's not important, but the, the non-physical part of you, really important, right? And so, We see these different layers that are talked about in Scripture. And and so we say, well, how can we protect a layer that we cannot see, that we do not, did not know, maybe even till this moment, that existed? And let me break it down to you in a physical part of how we're designed as God created us to be. Um, I'm going to use an egg because we all will identify with that. So here's an egg, all right? The egg has a shell, and the shell is representing the body, right? So we have a hard shell in the body. There's a shell around our heart cavity called the rib cage, and it's supposed to provide some sort of protection, okay? And so the body is the shell, but inside the body, the body uh, houses a soul. And think of the soul as the, um, uh, the, the... egg white, right? That's around the yolk, right? It's, it's, it's see-through. You can kind of see it. You, you know it's there, you, you, but, but, but the real heart of an egg, all right, is the yolk. Would you not agree? The heart of it is the yolk. That is the, that is the heart of the egg. And I will tell you, the heart of you, the innermost part of you is mentioned in Scripture as the Spirit. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 15, I'll let you read it later, it t- talks about the fact that there's a natural body and there's a spiritual body. The natural body is that shell. The spiritual body, in fact, in, in verse 45, it says that the first Adam, that's Adam, okay, Adam and Eve, uh, he was made a living soul, meaning God gave them life. When a body dies, the soul leaves. The soul spins somewhere forever. And so that is... That's the innermost part of your being, but there's a yoke that's missing when you are born. And the yoke of yourself is not your soul. That's the egg white. <laughs> the yoke is what, what the Bible refers to as your spirit. The last Adam, Jesus, made a quickening spirit, a spirit that's made alive. So when you are born, you are born a living soul, just like the first Adam. But when you are born again, as John 3 says, you are now made alive. There's something inside of you that has come alive. Now, why is that so important? It's so important because we need to know what we're protecting. We're putting a breastplate because we're protecting the most important part of us. And that is a figurative sense of the fact that you have to protect the part of you that Satan is gunning to get. If Satan can get your heart, he has you. If Satan can get the heart of a community, the heart of a family, if Satan can get the heart of a father, he can get the marriage. If Satan can get your heart, he has you. Would you agree? So Satan is constantly aiming for the heart. The problem is our self-righteousness is an obstacle to understanding our own weakness, our, our pride 
tells us that we're strong, but our humility informs us that we're weak. And so letter A, I want you to notice the fact that the fact that we need armor says that there is strength in admitting weakness. When we understand our weakness, we understand we need something to make us stronger than we really are. Our rib cage is not enough to go into battle and, and, and have swords and arrows thrown at us, right? You want some protection. Uh, it's the reason why uh, when, when you, you know, a, a police officer goes on the beat, he's wanting to put a bulletproof vest on. Why? Because he wants to go into a dangerous situation protected because he realizes that his flesh is too weak uh, to sustain bullets coming at him and in him, right? He wants something to protect him, to stop him. His strength is admitting his weakness. Many are trying to say that their weaknesses are not that big of a deal. I have people who tell me all that, tell me that all the time. And then many other people say, well, hopefully my good outweighs my bad. Other people say, well, you know, I've done some bad things, but I've done some good things. And I hope that in the end, my good things will make up for my bad things. And reality is there's no good that we could ever do to make up for the wrong that is inside of us. We are weak people, and our strength is admitting that weakness and that we need God's strength. So I want you to see some of these verses, and I want you to start with me, and I'm going to ask Pastor Joe to read this via video, but I want to start with uh, a few passages in Isaiah, Isaiah 64, 4 through 6. Let's start there. Verses 4 through 6. Let's start that over. Isaiah uh, 64, Neither 4 through 6. Neither I seen, O God, beside thee, what he hath prepared for him that waiteth for him. Thou meetest him that rejoiceth and worketh righteousness, those that remember thee in thy ways. Behold, thou wroth, for we have sinned, in those in continuance, and we shall be saved. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. There is, there's a picture that says, uh, those that are waiting on the Lord, those that are seeking the Lord, man, they, they find strength. That's what Isaiah says. But those that are wanting to lean on their own righteousness or their own goodness, they're going to fade as the leaf. There's the, our righteousness, the, 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 the most righteous person on earth. God looks down and sees that as filthy rags. I mean, it's not even close to the righteous standard that God gives. And so I, I think it's important for us to understand that our, 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 our heart will always lead us astray, that our heart is desperately wicked. Uh, Jeremiah says that, that, that you shouldn't trust your heart. You shouldn't follow your heart like our individualistic culture says because he says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? The Lord searched the heart and try the reins, the feelings. He, he knows how you feel. To give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Listen, God knows our heart. God knows what we say, what we do. He's the one who really knows the true us. He knows the ugly side of me better than anyone. But I will tell you this, that God in his strength wants to uh, see us as a broken people, as a weak people, and, and engage us if we're willing to lay down our weakness to him. But the, the problem is we, we, we want to follow our hearts. We want to follow our dreams. I have no problem with making goals and, 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 and following a dream. But what, what, what goes in the way of God's strength and God's righteousness is when we say, the picture that I have for my life is better or clearer or or, or a clearer picture and perspective than God's. That's when we have self-righteousness. That's when we're lifted up with pride to think that our way, our view is better than God's view. That's a problem. Uh, a way to illustrate this is the fact that many times someone will go on a trip or a vacation and the way that they've been picturing their vacation destination and the way it actually turns out to be are oftentimes two uh, entirely different things. Like, for instance, if I wanted to go to Thailand, I maybe think of someone in a boat with some Thai food, you know, and all of the different flavors. I've never been to Thailand. I think it would be cool, okay? But I'm told by those who have gone uh, that this is not a true picture of reality, that this is more 
more uh, of how the Thai food would be cooked or how you would get it from the street or whatnot. Um, if you were to go to the Great Wall of China, which is another destination I would love to go, and this is such a beautiful, serene spot in the world, but when you actually go, uh, it's many times overcrowded. Uh, there are people everywhere, and this is more a picture of reality, right? And so there's this, there's this thing that our heart might say, hey, this is how it's going to turn out. I can do better. I can be stronger. I, I, I can kick this. But reality is a different picture. You might want to go see the Mona Lisa in, in France, and it's a beautiful picture. And, uh, and you might want to get a good picture with that picture and one of the most famous art, art uh, pieces in the world. The reality is when you get there, it's very, uh, you're far away and it's, 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 it's surrounded by security and people and uh, taking pictures. And I'm, I'm, I'm told, again, I haven't been to this location, but I'm told that it stinks and it's just kind of like a bummer when you get there. And you, you have one expectation and there's actual reality. And I will tell you that following your heart, and this is so key, that following your heart will always lead to ultimate disappointment. Because the initial desire or vision never matches the final destination. Your heart is skewed. Your perspective is always off. And so we have to come back to his righteousness, his standard, and say, hey, I am weak, he is strong, so how can I lay down my weakness and receive his strength? Well, it, re it requires a second, letter B. I want you to see there's health in finding help and receiving help. A lot of people they wait too long to ask for help. They wait too long to tell someone what's wrong. Can I tell you that we're in a church where it's okay to not be okay? Can I tell you that it's okay to get some help? That it's okay to say, hey, I, I, I can't do this alone. I'm too weak. And so the fact that, that we need the whole armor of God is, is a testimony to the fact that we can't do it. We're not strong enough. Uh, we don't have enough protection. We need help. And he's given us the tools for protection and for help. And so we need to ask ourselves, how's our heart? But then letter or number two, I want you to ask ourselves, what are our values? You see, the greatest way to protect our heart is by asking, what does my heart value that God does or does not value? Is that such an important question? It's so important for us to ask, what does God value that my actions show that I value? What does he desire that my desires align with? What? What is God wanting that I want? What am I wanting that God doesn't want? And the reason why this is so important is because it's a breastplate of righteousness. Uh, the word righteous is uh, diosuke. It, it's, it's this word that is, in Hebrew is, is uh, siddiq. Uh, the, the word for righteous or, or right. In, in fact, in Jewish culture, even today, a Sadiq Jew is a Jew that follows all uh, 613 uh, laws of the Torah and all of the you know, 200 and something uh, rules uh, of the oral tradition and the Talmud and all of that. I will tell you that righteousness, though, in God's context is his standard. It is, his, it, it is what he accepts for uh, what is true and what is his standard of per perfection. So you ask yourself, well, wait a second, if God wants me to be perfect, he wants me to put on this breastplate of perfection, then how in the world am I ever supposed to live up to that standard? Bingo. That's the right question to ask. God values perfection. God values righteousness. So then the devil wants to creep over here and say, well, because you have been unrighteous, you have, not lived up to, you have not lived up to God's right standard, his rightness. Therefore, we often think that, okay, well then I deduct that God then doesn't value me. Or God values me less because I have been less righteous. You ever thought that way? I have. Let me paint the real picture. I want you to see that there are two things that we must value from, from, from this word righteous, okay? First, we must value who we are in Christ. 
We must value who we are in Jesus Christ. Now, Isaiah, going back to Isaiah, uh, he was the one that actually said that Jesus put on the breastplate of righteousness. I want you to see this in Isaiah chapter uh, 59 and verse number 12 through 17. Verse 17, you'll see uh, the, the, the uh, armor of God listed here, and this is what uh, Paul is referencing. Isaiah 59, verses 12 through 17. For our transgressions are multiplied before thee, and our sins testify against us. For our transgressions are with us, and as for our iniquities, we know them. In transgressing and lying against the Lord and departing away from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from the heart words of falsehood, and judgment is turned away backward, and justice standeth afar off. For truth is fallen in the streets, and equity cannot enter. Yea, truth faileth, and he that departeth from evil maketh himself a prey. And the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no judgment. And he saw that there was no man, and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore his arm brought salvation unto him, and his righteousness, it sustained him. For he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation upon his head. Now, the reason it mentions the helmet of salvation, which we'll get to in a couple weeks, and the breastplate of righteousness, is you cannot have one without the other. You see, the righteousness of God comes being with Jesus, in Jesus. You say, how in, that, how, how in the world is that? Well, our theme verse as a church is 2 Corinthians 5.17. And it's in your notes. It's that we are made new creatures, new creations in Christ Jesus. Behold, all things are made new. There is, there is a newness that Jesus gives when we receive him. You say, how do I receive him? Well, in Romans chapter 10 and verse number 9, it says, If thou wilt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. That helmet of salvation, he saves you from what? From your sin, from your unrighteousness, from your uh from your wretched state, which is what I was, but believing in the heart. With the man, with the heart, man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. You see, at the moment of salvation, you are placed in Christ. You are made new in Christ. So that new you is now operating in a different way, in a different manner. Now you are not operating in your own righteousness. Now you can operate in his righteousness. How many are thankful that we can operate not in our own goodness, but in his goodness? And that's why my life verse. Man, it was so freeing once I understood this, that he, God, made him, Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. If you couldn't tell... I get excited about that because I don't have to live up to my own standard of righteousness. I don't have to live up to your standard of righteousness. I don't even have to live up to the guy's righteousness on the plane who wanted me to put on and take off my mask. All I have to do is live up to Jesus's righteousness. You say, that's impossible. Exactly. It's not my righteousness. It's his. I am in him. He produces it in me. That is a freeing way to live. You say, I'm lost. I know I lost you, okay? But just stay with me. I want you to hand me that vest, and I'm thankful for, for Freddie being here and uh, being our guest today and helping us out. And, um, and, uh, but this is a vest that was worn uh, in, the, uh, in, the war, in the war in Iraq and Afghanistan, and, and uh, this, is, this is standard issue. This is what they, um, they used to wear. They have, they have new equipment, okay? Um, Kevlar, Okay, I, I took the Kevlar out, and you'll see why in a minute, uh, of, the, of the front. But uh, left the Kevlar in the neck and the shoulders, okay? Um, and, and again, standard issue. And the reason why they would, they would put this on is to give them protection that they do not possess. They, they don't, your, your, your body doesn't have the protection you need to go into battle. And so... The soldiers, the soldiers placed themselves 
at the mercy or inside the armor of a vehicle, which we'll talk about in a couple in a few weeks. At the end of this series, we're going to talk about the vehicle, the tank of prayer. It's going to be awesome, okay? I can't wait for that. Uh, but, but today we're talking about putting ourselves in the armor, in the, in the actual vest of righteousness. You say, man, I really want to do that. How do I place myself in the righteousness? Well, listen, twice in the Bible, in the New Testament specifically, it calls us Christians or Christ ones, right? But 140 times, it says we are in Christ. Everyone say that together. In Christ, we are placed in him. So here's the picture. I am valuing not me and my goodness and, and, and who you think I am. I am valuing who he thinks I am. I am valuing, as we sang today, who he says I am. I am valuing the new me. And you should value the new you. So letter B, how do we value the victory of being the new you? <laughs> The victory of the new you. Man, there is victory in Jesus Christ. How many of you know there are, there's victory in Jesus Christ? So we all know that. But what does it look like? How does it work on a day-to-day -day basis? Works like this. Instead of deciding that our righteousness and piecing together our own and, and, and hoping that there's not holes in the merit badges of our own righteousness, right? Instead of being, no, no, no. We're going to place God's righteous. We're going to place ourselves at the mercy and give the credit to God's righteousness. So where, where we would normally be trusting our own devices, we are going to take the truth of who we are in Jesus Christ and we are going to value that. We are going to live close to it. In fact, that is going to be our shield, our breastplate. That is what we are going to have. And instead of Kevlar, it's truth. And so literally, we are going to place the truth close to our heart and align our values with the values of God's word. And everywhere we walk and anything someone says and everything we do is aligned with the truth. It is our value. It is who we are. It is how we define things. It is how we live our life. It is the truth that sets us free from our own self-righteousness. And it is the belt of truth that anchors the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate of righteousness is who we are, our new you. The new you is at peace. I've given you some verses about that. Uh, the new you is not just at peace. The new you is, uh, is full of faith and love. The new you uh, is not just full of faith and love, but it's patient. It's a patient uh, servant and minister of God. I've given you verses for all of, all of this. And, and the new you is to be lived out on a daily basis because it is rewarded and right with God. It is, it is standing right with God, not because you are right, but because he was right for you. So you come with your righteousness as filthy rags and you say, God, I have no goodness, but what little goodness you see, it's Jesus in me. I have no desire, but the little desire I have is the spirit working in me. I have no peace, but the peace of the Holy Spirit working in me. Do you guys see how that works? It is Christ in you. And so we ask ourselves, how can we live out the new you? There's a passage of scripture in 1 Thessalonians 5 that gives us some specifics on how to live out the new you. And I want to give you four of these, four action items before we're finished, and uh, we'll go straight to the takeaway and be done. But letter uh, number one, Seek what, is, what God says is good. He says, seek what is good. Verse 22. Verse 23, I believe it is. Avoid uh, that which God says is evil and uh, you know, uh, refuse, uh, uh, avoid the appearance of evil and ask God to produce the right thinking and the right living in you. God can produce that. He is the one that sanctifies our hearts, verse 24 says, or 23, I think says. And then verse 24, I believe it is, 24 or 25 
it says to trust what God is doing in you. He is faithful who has called us, who also will do it. It is God that will produce the goodness and the righteousness in you because it's not yours in the first place. And so what we do is we drive the truth into us and we allow the righteousness of God to flow through us, to flow out of us. You say, I can't live right. I can't think right. I can't do what's right. And you're exactly right. But Christ can through you. When you place yourself in Christ and Christ is in you, the goodness and righteousness of God will come through you without you trying to do it. He is faithful who also will do it. Here's the takeaway and then we'll pray. And that is this. We need to be ready to face any conflict. but We can't be ready in our own power, in our own righteousness. We must be ready by protecting our heart and accepting God's values as our own. The greatest thing that will protect a marriage, the greatest thing that will protect a heart, the greatest thing that will protect a dating relationship, that will protect our thoughts that will protect our peace, our joy, that will protect our children. The greatest thing is aligning our values with God's values to say, God, my heart is yours. My heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? But I do know that your righteousness can correct whatever's wrong. We live in a broken world and our broken world needs the grace of God. Our broken world needs the righteousness of God. Truth is fallen in the streets, as Isaiah 59 says. Judgment is turned backward. We've talked about that last week. But the only remedy for a world full of unrighteous confusion is the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. And it's when we seek to be in that righteousness that others see and look and say, wow, that's not them. That must be Christ in them. Let's pray. God, we want to be wrapped up in your righteousness. Not just to be ready for the battle, but God, to grow, to live our Christian lives the way you designed them. God, you never designed us to try to prove something that you've already proven on the cross. God, Sometimes we, we try so hard to put on some facade of our own righteousness. And Lord, you know, it just tickles me when people say there's hypocrites in the church because God, there's just a bunch of sinners in every church. There's no righteousness on anyone other than your righteousness. And so God, we're just honest enough to say we're not okay. And anything good in us is you in us. So Lord, we wrap ourselves in your righteousness and we're thankful that when we received you as our Lord and Savior, you stamped righteousness on our soul. God, I will never get over that. I'm such a self-righteous person without you. And so Lord, I reject my idea of righteousness and I turn toward your righteousness. And I pray that everyone in this room would do that. I pray that if there's one here that's never received you as their Lord and Savior, they've never turned away from their sin and turned toward you, that they would do that today. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. And as we finish the service, I, I wanna ask you to, to do a couple things. Just take an inventory. The first is do you have a moment that you can point to where you turn from trying to be right on your own and you turn to Jesus as the only one who could be right for you? If you've never had a moment where you've heard the word of God and in faith you've responded, faith cometh by hearing and hearing the word of God. If you've never had a moment where you've responded to the truth, not in a prayer, because prayer doesn't save us, but in a moment of belief, meaning turning from trusting yourself and turning to trust God. If you've never had that moment, I would encourage you to have it right now. You can pray in your own words. I'm not, I'm not even gonna lead you in a prayer. I'm gonna ask you to pray. If you're watching online, on the radio, if you're in this room, I want you just to say, God, I'm a sinner and I need you. 
I turn from myself and I turn to you. Did you know that Jesus died, rose again so that you could have forgiveness of your sins so that you wouldn't have to try to do better or try to have your good outweigh your bad or anything like that? Religion is such a lie because it says that you can get to God by your goodness, but there's no way. Jesus was the only way. So if you've trusted him, maybe even just right now, you called out to him in your heart and your life and you turned to Jesus and welcomed him into your heart and your life. If you did that, then right now you are a new creature. You are a new creation in Jesus Christ and you have been, your soul has been stamped with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. It doesn't mean you will always live up to that righteousness, but that righteousness, you are in that righteousness and now you have no excuse other than to have his righteousness living out and through your life. As we talk about this from week to week, I think you'll really understand the fact that it's really just the spirit in us that renews us day by day. And every single day, we're looking a little bit more like the righteous standard of Jesus. There's a little bit of of us that is being transformed from the inside out. It's called sanctification. I would encourage you right now to say something like this. Just have a moment of prayer, but just say, God, anything good in me is you in me. I give you the credit and the glory for anything that's right in me. And then surrender yourself to his righteousness. Put on that breastplate of righteousness daily, seeking the truth, seeking to align your values with his, and allow him to be your power and protection you need to live your Christian life. I would encourage you to take a moment in prayer. And then I'll, I'll say a prayer for everyone, but I, I want you to pray right now before the Lord. Make a decision, write it down. Uh, make, make some traction spiritually in this moment. Let's take a moment for prayer and meditation. Lord, the encouraging thing about the breastplate of righteousness is we're all in need of it. We're all in need of it because we don't have our own righteousness that we can attest to or polish up and it wouldn't work in battle anyway. And so, Lord, we forsake our own self-righteousness and pride and we turn to you. We put on this piece of armor to protect our heart, protect the the very life that you've given us. And we pray that your idea of living an abundant life would be what we would value. And God, we would not seek what the world says is right or what we maybe even feel is right, but we would live through the prism and through the, the vision of your word and what truth says is right. Lord, we pray that you would please help every decision that was made. I pray that it would uh, call us to action, that we would live lives of freedom and victory because we are in you (laughs) and you have given us the victory. And now all we have to do is uh, live in that victory. I pray that our lives would reflect the the truth that we've heard in Jesus' name. Amen.